Mr. Chairman, sir, with the permission now, I will call the guest speaker, who has a flight to catch very soon. We are not so young. What happened in these 23 years? Democracy, public, good governance, and the question of the national integrity. Please welcome Dr. Kyle Diopayo. His Excellency, Governor Muhammad Ibadar Abubakar, Governor of Jigawa State, my brother, my friend and comrade. The Chairman of the Government Council of Manbaya House, His Excellency Professor Afiz Abubakar, former Deputy Governor of Kano State. Mr. Vice Chancellor Sir, Professor Abbas, Vice Chancellor of Bayeri University Kano. <coughs> Our Royal Father, His Highness Sir King Kano, AP represented by Turakin Kano. Members of the House of Assembly, members of the Executive Council from Jigawa, from Ikiti, and from Kano State. Current Director of Mambaya House and all the former directors here present. Distinguished Senator Lawan Shaibu, our leader in All Progressive Congress, the Chairman of All Progressive Congress here from Jigawa and from Kano. The Catholic Bishop of Kano Diocese and the Chairman the Council of Ulamas. I have a lot of friends there, friends from way back in academia who are all here. Uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention my friend from way back in my days at Northwestern University, Professor Habu Mohammed, <laughs> Director General of the National Orientation Agency, Dr. Garba Abari, the Secretary General of the Arewa Consultative Forum, Elijah Mutala Aliu. Very many important personalities here present. Forgive me if I have skipped your name. There are too many of you that are important, and we are all important. All of us who are here on this important anniversary of Mambaya House. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my own brother, my Ebon Alaji Muftal Baba Ahmed. The President of ASU, my comrade, student union leaders, community leaders, political leaders, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press. First and foremost, let me say just how delighted I am to be back in this historic and colorful city of Kano, one of the most vibrant centers of commerce, of manufacturing, of learning, of culture and governance in the entire African country. With a long historical pedigree. Indeed, this is a city that easily ranks among the oldest continuous political communities in Africa, serving over the years as a meeting point and a melting pot of various peoples from near and far, and a veritable center of different cultures they carried with them as they settled within its precincts. It is little wonder that history, that amidst its history of continuity, of fusion and change, Kano has been a center of memory, of experimentation, of innovation, and of transformation. And I'm particularly most delighted to be back in Mambaya House after a long period. The last time I was here, my brother and friend, 
Professor Atari Richard, that was the director, and that was quite a long time ago. My buyer house has grown in leaps and bounds since then. Successive rulers of the different state systems that have been established in the Kano area over the centuries have not only learned to manage diverse groups of peoples, they have also had to steer the constantly evolving dynamic of state society relations. The ethnocultural diversity that has characterized this city, the dexterity of its various rulers in managing the diversity, and the resultant benefits for the city in economic prosperity have added to build a strong and unique sense of patriotic identity and pride in the average Kanawa. This is despite the fact that many of its residents are the products of various migratory flows. And that's why we have amongst us in this audience the leadership of not only the Igbo community and the Yoruba community, but also many leaders from various parts of the country. And I welcome you all. Sir. Let me also say, as part of my remarks, that the immense pleasure and honor with which I stand before you today to deliver this lecture commemorating the 21st anniversary of Mambaya House is directly connected to the person whose memory and legacy it partly serves to preserve and keep alive. Around this time last year, I was in Ariwa House to deliver a lecture on the 50th anniversary of Ariwa House. And as you know, Ariwa House is also the residence of our former founding father, uh, one of them, uh, Alaji Amadi Bedo Sadana of Sokoto. Don't ask me if I am here to balance the equation. <laughs> but I think it bears retelling that as we all know, this is a house that is packed with significance and symbolism. It was the abode of the late Malam Amino Kano, which after his death was taken over and converted initially to the Kano office of the Center for Democratic Studies, and Mr. Vice Chancellor actually went into that uh, historical trajectory before becoming the seat of the Amino Kano Center for Democratic Research and Training. Indeed, I want to thank the Vice Chancellor and Director of Mambaya House for the honor of the invitation to present this address on the 21st anniversary. But I would also like to pay tribute to all the directors of Mambaya House, those who have gone and those who are still here with us. And I'm glad we have two of them right here in this audience right from its founding director, Professor Atayri Jega, to the current director, Professor Zango, for the excellent work done over the years in maintaining this edifice as the one-stop shop for the study and memorialization of Malan Amino Kano. As a site, and in its uses, after the passing of its occupant, Mambaya House serves the important purpose of celebrating that inimitable champion of the working poor. The popular name by which the place is known, namely Mambaya House, is derived from the nickname of his late mother. The Saadu Zungo Auditorium, in which this lecture is taking place, is named after one of his closest political associates and faithful fellow travelers. Mambaya House, therefore, brings with multiple symbolism centered on all that the late Malam Amino Kano meant to us and to our country. You will understand, therefore, that as we mark the 21st anniversary of the house, it is appropriate to remember the life and times of Malam Amino Kano and pay justified tribute to his memory. Born on the 9th of August, 1930, and as an early beneficiary of both Quranic and Western education, 
Mala as he came to be known affectionately very quickly carved the niche for himself as the preeminent voice and champion of the Talakawa, that mass of peasants, the urban working poor, and the class. His emergence and growth into this role emanated from a deep-seated set of values that he embraced and honed at an early stage in his political career and held on to tenaciously for the rest of his life. Consigned by the reported excesses that were built into the colonial, licensed native authority system, and convinced that the system needed to be overturned in order for the Talakawa to be able to have a fighting chance to live a decent and dignified life free of oppression. He committed himself to organizing the mass of the people to exercise their agency to imagine and create an alternative political order. The principal agency through which he did this was the movement which he helped to found in 1950 and which was named the Northern Element Progressive Union, NEPU. The establishment of NEPU was to mark a significant milestone in the history of political radicalism in Nigeria. The tradition of radicalism which it represented was carried over into the late 1970s and beyond by the People's Redemption Party, which Malam Aminokano also led. Much of the history of the early political life and exploits of Malam and Nepu will be familiar to many in this audience and has been amply documented and dissected by at least two generations of scholars. Ali, among the most thorough and illuminating is the book by the frontline political scientist, Professor A.D. Yaya, who transited into eternity a few weeks ago, but whose legacy lives on through his writings, particularly the native authority system in northern Nigeria, 1950 to 1970, and the two generations of students he mentored and inspired. Given that Mambaya House was mandated and endowed by the authorities of Bayo, Bayo University to preserve the memory and legacy of the late Malam Amino Kano through research and training on democratic governance writ large. It is important to draw a few lessons and you might say additional lessons to the ones that my brother, the governor of Chigawa State, has already posed in the form of questions to Mambaya House and to the larger audience. From the life experience and political career of Malam Amin Khan, which I find to be an enduring part of his contribution to our nation and relevant to our contemporary circumstances as a people, and in responding to the theme of this lecture on democracy, good governance, and the question of national integration. The first point I'd like to raise in this regard, and one which has found recurring resonance with me is the life of principles, courage of conviction, enduring commitment to a just cause, and consistency in public service. And for much of his life, despite the fickle and slippery terrain of politics and against various odds, Malan stood by his principles and convictions. Whether you trace his career in teaching in biology, or you go through his experience when he was the education officer and principal of Maru Teacher Training College, or when he resigned from that job to return back home to help with the formation of the Northern Teachers Association and subsequently formed a number of local schools that match Arabic Quranic school training with mainstream and your Saxon training, you would discover that consistently Malam Aminu maintained a life of principle and courage of and consistency in public service. Even when he didn't have an idea of what he was going to do when he resigned from his job in Maru, he came back 
to Kano and eventually became, in addition to being the General Secretary of the Northern Teachers Association, the main administrative officer on a salary of eight pounds. And yet, he never stopped organizing the political class here for revolutionary change. But more than that, he organized within the realms of democratic politics to defend his principles and mobilize for his conviction. The courage and consistency he projected at all times, won in the respect of even his opponents and critics, and the undiluted respect and adulation of the masses. And that included even the Sadana of Sokoto. Indeed, he was built to have a, a meeting organized by Sheikh Gumi just the day after the 1966 coup occurred. And that was a meeting where they were going to settle a lot of political differences with the Sadana at the time. So even when he, was, he disagreed with you, he was never disagreeable in his approach to politics. So Mama Mamino Kano stood shoulder to shoulder with the likes of Kwame Nkrumah, Ahmed Sekuture, Ahmed Bembela, and Julius Nyerere, and other icons of African liberation from the shackles of colonial rule. And the nephew he led shared many similar attributes with Nkrumah's Convention's People's Party, CPP. Flowing out of my first point is a second related one. For all of the political influence and power which he came to enjoy, once it became clear that his movement was not going to fade out or be destroyed by its rivals, Madam Amin kind of stood out in our entire post-colonial experience as the very antithesis of money politics. Again, the point that the chairman has made about how we now lionize those who worship money politics. Malam Amin Okano was the antithesis of money politics. The weight of the man across Nigeria generally, and in northern Nigeria in particular, did not depend on his ability to dole out tons of money to his followers and fellow travelers, but rather the trust and faith they had in him as the honest, indefatigable, and reliable torchbearer of their interests, whom they could trust at all times. This is something, there is something in this for all of us who are practicing politicians today. The third point I'd like to make about the life and legacy of Malan centers on the important place of ideas and ideology. Again, a point made by the chairman in his opening remarks, in his entire political engagement. Malam Amin Kano built his emancipatory politics around a clear set of ideas and an ideology of empowerment for the Talakawa that left no one in doubt as to what he stood for and what he represented. In this regard, the Sawaba Declaration of December 1950, which he issued, marked a historic milestone in his ideological journey, delineating him and his partisans from the more mainstream sections of the rapidly growing nationalist movement for self-rule and independence in our country. At a time when we seem to have increasingly relegated ideas and ideology to the background. The experience and example of Madame Amino Kano serves as a poignant reminder to us that there once was a time in our national history when ideas drove political choice and affiliation. Those times can still be reinvented and should be reinvented if we stand ready to pause for a bit and learn from the likes of Madame Amino Kano, especially in these testy and treacherous times in our national history when we are in need of a constant flow of fresh and refreshing ideas 
for our national rebirth and advancement. A fourth point that I have drawn out of the life experience of Madame Amino Kano, which is very relevant to our quest for good government and national integration <coughs> for our education and re education in this time is the central place of modesty, humility, and moderation in the making of the successful servant leader. All through his life, from his abode here in Mambaya House and the high density Bermuda quarters in which it is located, to his dress code, his offices, and his worldly goods, Mara was the epitome of modesty, simplicity, and moderation. This in turn made him one of the most accessible leaders in history to date. It also ensured that the masses easily identified with him as one of them. The fifth and last point I would like to bring to our attention centers on the great store which Malan said by the place and role of education in the making of personal dignity, social advancement, and nation building. Whether it be by the open encouragement and calls which he made for the education of girls, or the assistance he gave to his staff and followers to acquire education, including, if necessary, self-education. He understood the liberating power of learning and the acquisition of knowledge and skills in the empowerment of the people and the making of the nation. He even justified, after much reluctance, the taking of the second wife precisely because he wanted his wife to continue her education rather than the threat of stopping of education. That is not what we see these days. When people take wives these days, the likelihood is that it is to stop them from pursuing the quest for knowledge rather than uh, uh, promoting it. For someone who was trained as a teacher and who also practiced the profession for a period of time, his strong interest in the liberating power of education should probably not be surprising. However, for Madame Amino Kano, education was also a weapon for emancipation, and he encouraged it in the conviction that it was a necessary tool for self-actualization and societal progress. Little wonder then that he started his political activism, as I indicated earlier, with a central role in the formation of the Northern Teachers Association. In his time, as recounted by Dr. Jibrin Ibrahim, one of his young political assistants, Dr. Eyu Jalingo, who later went on to become a senior lecturer and role model in the Department of Political Science in this great university, told of the experience whereby Malam invested his time between political meetings to teach some of his personal staff who hadn't been to school, how to read and write. That was a mark of just how important education was to him. And it is a sector to which we must devote a considerable amount of attention anew in our continued quest for the combination of workable policies that will enable us once and for all to turn the table of underdevelopment in Nigeria. Policies designed to advance agendas of state and nation building or strengthening democratic governance demand that we take to heart the kinds of social concerns that were at the center of the worldview and politics of Malam Amino Kano. These policies must be premised on the starting point which he knew so well that no political order can endure where majority of its members wallow in abject poverty and exist in a state of disempowerment. And this is why, in the midst of our debate about the national question, about restructuring, about secessionist agitation, and the various options for restructuring the polity, it is absolutely important that we remind ourselves that there are underlying social questions that urgently require to be addressed as well. For the crisis of Nigerian nationhood with which we are presently grappling is not simply reducible 
only to the competing ethnicities or religiosities. It is also about a crisis of social livelihoods. Every political system derives its legitimacy and is held together by the investment which is made in the empowerment of the citizenry and the protection of their welfare and well-being. Citizen empowerment, as articulated by the generation of Madam Amino Khan, was structured correctly, in my view, around the provision through public policy of the basic tools by which individuals and groups could advance themselves in life. That is why, at independence, across Nigeria, there was a significant investment in the educational and health sectors that are at the heart of social policy. Healthy citizens, equipped with the requisite skills of knowledge, could not only get employment, but also create employment themselves. No wonder then that in the first two decades of our independence, in tandem with and flowing from public policy, social policy investments, Nigeria enjoyed a phase of generalized upward mobility in their lives because we concentrated on human capital development, the point that the chairman also eloquently made. Following the onset of economic crisis in the period from the early 1980s, and as a direct result of some of the austerity measures at all that, are, that had to be put in place, the social expenditures of government at all levels of the federal system suffered a broad a broad ranging retrenchment. The structural adjustment measures that were subsequently introduced exacerbated a worsening social situation that effectively eroded the social contract underpinning the country's governance. This is the background to our slide into ranks of the countries around the world that harbor the highest number of working poor and the outrightly excluded. Massive and long-term unemployment, especially amongst our youth, growing social inequality in the country, and the overall thinning out of the middle class are among some of the challenges that now stare us in the face every day. It does not take a magician, therefore, to see that we are confronted with a highly combustible cocktail of mass poverty mass unemployment, and massive inequalities that are already generating various discontent in insurgency, in criminality, in banditry, and various violent extremisms. I want to submit that taking determined and bold steps to address these social problems head-on is as urgent and crucial as the energies we may be required to devote to recalibrating and updating the structures of our federal system. To do so meaningfully, we cannot avoid offering Nigerians a new social bargain around which we can build, rebuild our citizenship, national identity, and the legitimacy of the Nigerian state. If you ask me, Nigeria and Nigerians now need a new Sawaba declaration that will constitute that will constitute our collectively shared national manifesto of emancipation from poverty, unemployment, inequality, marginalization, and generalized immiseration. And it is not enough, even if this is happening on varying degrees of scales in our various states, until it coalesce into a generalized form of social contract at the national level, it will not amount to the critical impact that we would like it to have. Thinking through what a new social compact for Nigeria might be, we can borrow a leaf from the late Madam Amino Kano and resolve that as part and parcel of the bargain of being a citizen of Nigeria, we will strive to design universal social policies that will enable the generality of our people to renew their faith in the country and their government. Universal access to education should be accompanied by a system of universal health care. It should be on
I would like to argue that those of us who believe that a new Nigeria, a better Nigeria is possible, must get to work quickly on the comprehensive development of this social compact, one which must elevate the dignity of the human person and promote the principles of common good, solidarity, stewardship, subsidiarity in the functioning of government, active participation of our citizenry, rights and responsibility, economic justice, as well as peace and security. <laughs> this should be the manifesto that we collectively work on to address the existential threat to the survival and thriving of the Nigerian state. When the generation of the late Mala Mamino Khan was faced with what the historic Sahaba Declaration described as the shocking state of social order, they summoned the courage to organize themselves to profile alternatives that they felt would allow for a social redress. The new Sahaba Declaration, which we must produce in order to tackle the myriad of discords and discontents afflicting us today, must, it seems to me, aim at nothing less than the rebuilding of the social policy anchor of the Nigerian state. That is a task we must give ourselves, and it is a task we must also ask Mambaya House to coordinate. We owe ourselves nothing less. We owe the memory of the late man of Amino Kano nothing less. And let us rise up to the call as a people determined in unity and in shared hope to take a giant leap forward. In conclusion, please allow me to return to Madame Aminu Kano's oft-quoted saying in outside. The Gary Adayate Amakoa is an Bidal Ranchi. Coming from a top, an early nationalist who actively participated in the decolonization of Nigeria and indeed of Africa, we owe it to ourselves and to him to pause and ask what the great sage of uh, an inimitable scholar mean by this powerful, short, beefy, and memorable statement. It is my firm conviction that these words of wisdom are a clear message of guidance to us Nigerians on unity in diversity and on national integration. But it spoke to an integration to an integration that is content laden not an integration of empty rhetoric. It is an enduring call to remind all of us that though by God's design we all come from somewhere, our various father's houses, our primary areas of extraction, nevertheless, we must at all times ensure national cohesion and unity without which peace and progress will never be achieved. It is my conviction. that the best way to honor the memory of this teacher, this philosopher, mentor, father, political activist, organizer extraordinaire, and patriot for Absalom, is to continue to organize and stop agonizing in order to successfully achieve national integration on the basis of social justice, fairness, and equity. Happy 21st anniversary to